This is episode 61 with Dr. Robin Kira. Welcome to Spot On Insurance. Join us each week as we speak to insurance professionals, attorneys, regulators, and compliance specialists on topics ranging from improving your agency to staying on the right side of the law. Subscribe and stay informed on the effects of new trends and disruptive emerging technologies on your businesses and your industry. Welcome to Spot on Insurance. I'm Ted Tavares. And I'm Arlene Tavares. Our guest today, Dr. Robin Kira, is arguably one of the best known insurtech and fintech thought leaders and influencers. In his talks, as well as behind the scene, Robin is known for his clear and concise analysis, roadmaps with hands-on actions, and large network that stretches around the world. For over 10 years, Robin worked for large insurers and startups, setting up structures and processes to increase the chances of success for innovation and product development. He is the founder of digitalscouting.de. Dr. Kira, welcome aboard Spot On Insurance. Thank you for having me. You've had quite an extensive career. You've worked with the old guard, what I call the traditional insurance community, Allianz, Munich Re, and you definitely have a lot of experience with startups. So one of the biggest topics right now is the traditional insurance broker, how they will cross the bridge and be able to accelerate their learning and embrace a lot of the new emerging technology. You know, they need to do that or else uh, they can face extinction, right? Which is tremendous thing to think about when we're talking about a $3 trillion industry. But before we kind of go on to talking about some of the solutions, let's talk a little bit about your background. I know that at some point when you were in high school, you were a foreign exchange student in Midland, Texas. Tell us what you found about the significant cultural differences, if any. Oh, well, of course, uh, there were some cultural differences. Uh, but I think a lot of uh, that had also to do with me just being 15 and 16 years old. So it's like almost a century ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, one topic um, I actually really still, uh, what I took away is surely country music. <laughs> I listen to it all the time. I'm so happy that we have Spotify now and the streaming things. So I can, you know, get my private country music channels there, my Spotify list. So I'm really excited about that. I stayed at a lovely family, the Carter family in, in Midland, Texas. My host, Dad D. Carter, was a financial advisor too. So I, um, that was my first contact, I think, with the work of a broker slash financial advisor. So that was that. But I took a lot uh, away from my time at Lee High School and uh, going to prom and doing all the teenage stuff, what she teenagers should and should not do. In, in the <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we're familiar with that. Well, you know, Ted and I, um, actually, right now, we are currently in Texas. And, you know, we have a big presence, uh, 65 employees in Texas. But many years ago, we also had a foreign exchange student, and he was from Cologne, Germany. And he lived with us for a year, Toby. Right. And we absolutely loved him one of the he wanted to embrace everything that was us and one of the things when we first picked him up from the airport in houston i said to him toby now tell me what you like to eat and what you don't like to eat and he said to me if you eat it i eat it and i was like oh man this kid is gonna be amazing and we are still great friends and his family has adopted us and likewise, and we still keep in touch to this day. Great. I want to read this quote that you have on your website. I think it captures the essence of what we want to talk about. And it says, in its 500-year history, the insurance industry has not seen such pressure for change. Technological advancements around the world are changing the way customers communicate, collaborate, and consume. One industry after the other, for example, retail, publishing, music, TV, cinema, automobile, gets disrupted by artificial intelligence, digital distribution, new platforms, blockchain, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, internet of things, and so many more. Besides that, in every corner of the world, young entrepreneurs are founding startup and short tech companies aiming at disrupting the industry and attacking the value chain. Profitability and stability of decade and century old incumbent insurers. We see that as we're going around the country at different conferences, and we feel that from the people that are there. And we're seeing it happening right now. My thought is, if you're a fat and comfortable insurer, you may be in trouble because there are a lot of hungry insure tech cats right behind you. 
Yeah, and I mean, it's like so you don't see the train coming. Uh, you think it's the end of the light of the tunnel, but it's actually a freight train heading your direction. I believe the issue or the challenges are not those insurers that um, go out of the comfort zone and confront themselves in insurance, insurtech, technology conference. Um, I attend regular conferences in Europe or the US or in the MENA region or in Asia, and the problems are not those 1%, 2% insurers that are there. The problems are the 99% that are not. So we already get scared by the stories of the people, of the innovators, of the companies that attend and try to learn and to innovate and to try to get a competitive edge. What can we think about the companies that don't even attend? And um, I think it's strange that we live in times, maybe the first time in human history, where the knowledge of the world is out there. You can actually learn anything on uh, YouTube and other channels, um, and you can go to conferences. You don't even need to pay the entrance fee. A lot of them stream everything or go online. But you know, you have one industry right now that sometimes the impression is fat, or at least certain persons in this industry are fat. And sometimes I have the impression it's like being on a sailboat, they see already retirement island, and they know it <laughs> doesn't matter how many holes this boat has, they will go on make it to the sand, even though if the people you know down there, a few levels uh, actually rowing, they are not making it. Uh-huh. Um, that's my impression, at least. Right. I mean, Ted and I were just recently at a conference in San Francisco, and three heads of the companies were being interviewed. Two of them talked about in great detail what they were doing within their organization to reinvent themselves, what they were doing with AI and um, just different things that they were doing. And the third executive just said that they weren't exploring any of the new digital technology. What they were doing was trying to enhance their customer experience. And I thought, oh my goodness, I don't know if they're going to be around for very long. So I know that you have some strong opinions on that, on, you know, if there's a head of a company that's not well-versed in all of these uh, changes that's taking place and embracing digital technology, I'd love to hear your opinion. If a CEO or a C-suit doesn't know the answer, that's not the problem. The problem is when he doesn't look for it and ignores it. Um, I know several entrepreneurs or senior managers of large insurers that uh, did not grow up with cell phones and Wi-Fi and AI and all the beautiful stuff we have nowadays. But Mm -hmm. they forced themselves to get to know the things or they hired massively people who know the drill. And um, this is but a minority. Um, Again, there are in a lot of cases nowadays smaller insurers or insurers run by entrepreneurs or even some very large insurers. But the majority doesn't do it. And I have worked for several ones or did projects or several ones. And um, my impression sometimes is especially those um, that don't do it. um, They are overwhelmed um, in in a lot of parts, lack knowledge of what's actually going on, lack of knowledge of software development, lack of knowledge of product development. For example, I attended senior management meetings um, that were um, overlooking certain software development projects at an insurer. And the teams came back every month for this meeting and presented their progress. And me coming from software development, or at least having spent quite considerable time there, was wondering, what did the teams actually do? I mean, I see now here in a new mock-up and there a new picture, but I could anest- uh, estimate how much time that an intern would have cost, maybe four hours. What did they do the rest of the months with their 10, 15, 20 people? And the senior managers, they just paddled their shoulders and were so proud that the button isn't green anymore, but yellow. And I was like, what you get <laughs> right now? And it was so (laughs) obvious that they had a completely lack of understanding of software development, of digital product development, and innovation in general. That's okay when you made your career in the insurance industry in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. But if you feel this, you have to be very honest, there are two possibilities. But if you are the CEO, you need to clean house and get the people on board in responsible positions that know the drill, that know how to do digital transformation, that know, that have a track record of putting digital products out there and that have proven it somewhere else. And if your best buddy, Rick and Kevin are there and you have been in the trenches of uh, brokerage sales in the 80s and 90s and you like them and you know, you go uh, at lunch uh, uh, every day, that's okay. <laughs> but you need to take them into consideration the fate of thousands of families and people that are uh, relying on you doing your job. And um, I actually 
had a small, um, a small, I should not say, but a considerable um, disagreement with Susi Suit here in Germany, who in an interview had the audacity to say online sales is a niche mm. in 2018. And I called him out on that. And uh, my, my main, my last words were actually people who think that, again, just change your management team and surround you with people that are able to do it or resign. If you don't have that knowledge, you have to surround yourself with people that have that knowledge and that it is the responsibility of the senior managers to take into account that they are feeding, you know, oftentimes thousands of people. So those people are depending on them to lead them through this transition. I don't see all of this stuff as disruption. I see it more like evolution because when the horse and buggy came and the car, the vehicle came, you had the same situation happen. What you had was an evolution in the industry. But isn't evolution very closely tied to extinction? And that's what we're going to see with these people who are making these claims that you're saying. So it's definitely, you know, to go on what Ted's saying, if you don't evolve, you're going to be extinct. The challenge right now is in contrast to banking. Banking is even under bigger pressure than insurance. The problem is that um, a lot of insurers, at least in Europe, and I know of them also in the U.S., have, um, first of all, a still working business model. Second, a lot of um, um, quiet reserves, we call it in Germany, meaning a lot of real estate uh, ownership. So even if they go um, operate, operative negative uh, in their, in their uh, yearly um, outcome, it still means that they can survive a long, 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 long time only from existing contracts. So, mm. um, so that, that, that um, pressure is not there uh, so radically. But even if people say to me from the traditional side, oh, our KPIs still look great, then I say, okay, that may be that your overall company numbers still look okay, but please show me your new business KPIs, show me your demographics, show me your customer cohorts, and compare them to 10, 15 years ago. And uh, most of them get done really, really quiet, or if they are the innovators of the company, smile and say, yes, that's what I say internally all the time too. And is <laughs> are whole generations missing? Why are they missing? They get their stuff somewhere else, mostly from digital aggregators around here. Um, but maybe one more point I want to make is, Actually, we live in the most exciting times probably since human mankind ever existed. Why? Because we have free distribution. We have these little black things called phones um, around and you can make a video and, and that goes viral and you are more powerful than all the directors of Hollywood together 20 years ago. So why, should, why are we talking only about depression, about, uh, about defensive, about restructuring, optimizing processes? Why aren't we talking in the industry about tremendous growth? Why are we talking about focusing our value chain or defending our value chain? Why are we not talking about expanding it and, and growing it? Absolutely. So you go out there and you meet with lots of companies. Do you ever get the sense that a lot of companies are fearing that they're going to lose their expertise to a lot of the new and exciting startups that are popping up all over the place? Do they have that fear of the brain drain? No, because um, most don't understand that after generations of people that were happy to work for a stable employer now are looking for different things. Um, I know of an um, insurer that did a large restructuring and not only offering compensation packages for people they wanted to go, but to everybody who wanted. So what happened? The good left. The young left. The motivated left. And uh, not the people who actually should have gone um, or who were targeted. So um, I don't see a brain drain. Um, what I see is... Um, that third level managers like team leads uh, leave insurers and highly motivated uh, young people that work there one, two, three, four years and then go somewhere else because they can't stand it anymore. And the organizations don't recognize it. They, they, they ignore it. Um, I had this several times, this behind the scene talks uh, with peers or with people that, um, that the, um, the, the reaction of the industry or the specific company was like, uh, well, you know, he's gone, no, not a problem. But they had, they had the problem that people under 30, under 40 were leaving. They did not see that. And they, I think the pressure is not so large yet. Hmm. Really, one of the things from the material that I read from your website, what I'm sensing when we go to a lot of these insure tech conferences and from those, those professionals in the insurance industry who do attend, I sense a lot of confusion and fear. And what I mean by this is 
they don't know what to do because they are being hit from so many sides, whether it's, what do we do with blockchain? What do we do on this side? So can you, from your experience, give them a little guidance on how to start preparing? Because what do you do first? This is the question that, I, that I've heard posed uh, a few times in some of our conferences. We're not sure as a company what to do first. We get so busy trying to make this happen. First of all, getting rid of the legacy systems. Yeah. Then we've got cybersecurity to worry about. Then blockchain. How do we approach this monster? Do you mean from an individual level or from a company level? From a company level. So it depends where you stand. I think the first um, issue or first approach is to have an honest look in the mirror and really say, where do we truly and honestly stand? This means technically, where are we? How many legacy systems do we have? Organizationally, um, how hierarchical are we? Where is it still necessary? Where is it? Where do we need to change? And culturally, for and foremost, what kind of culture do we have? In Europe, most insurers are over 100 years old, and they came into the world in times of industrialization. And in those times, it was um, urgent that the worker in the, sem the, in the assembly line did the same hand move as all workers at this station. So you had strong hierarchies, you had written work processes, you had and deviation from the norm was considered a failure. But nowadays, deviation from the standard should, or in most cases, could be interpreted as creativity. And a lot of insurers still have this industrial culture in their DNA and that. Some are trying, some are doing something, but I think if you don't, you need to change and tackle this first and foremost. Because if you um, open a lab and hire new people, or if you buy uh, an insurtech and try and, and, and hope that they juvenile you, um, but you don't change your, your, your company culture, at least try to change it, starting from the top, by the way, then I see large issues. So my main plea would be, guys, look in the mirror, where are you standing and what do you need to do for cultural change? And um, of course, there are a lot of other um, uh, topics too um, that, that could be addressed. I think in the end, to be very honest, we need also to preserve our existing business model. If you make 99.9% .9 of your money from one business model, you need to preserve it. But at the same time, when you see that there is an issue, think about the investing strategy. And another topic I think that has also to do with culture, I would say love your customers, not your products. What does it mean in an insurance context? Um, insurers, at least those who I know quite well, they have sales plans. That means this year we need to sell 50,000 accident insurances. We don't know if our customer actually need 50,000 accident insurance. Maybe they need 20,000 health and 30,000 liability and whatever. But this has been very strong hierarchical organizations that go out there and push the stuff into the customer base. This has worked because the barrier for entry in our industry was so high. So we could actually do to the customer whatever we want. Um, we sold industry and we sold products the customer did not understand. And in some cases, um, we did not pay. And some products even were designed as they sounded great, but we didn't pay in the end. Um, and I think this is also the reason why we're not popular. I mean, to be honest, the insurance industry is not the populist around. Um, uh -huh. And I think this needs, if you go to products, we need to provide our customers, we need to totally radically think differently. We need to provide our customers digital, but also non-digital products and services for free. Do I mean we need to give away insurance coverage for free? No, I think we just need to know to use our knowledge um, about the customer, about society, about the world, and to provide it to him, uh, to the persons. For example, if you are a reinsurer and you, um, have, you are insuring high complex industrial complexes, um, there are hundreds of them in the world um, and you have 40 of them in your portfolio. You should know when uh, several of them have a certain technical problem, maybe after you run a certain large machine 40,000 hours, maybe you should inform the other ones that are in your portfolio or actually you should inform all of them that they should look at this machine at an hour 39,000. I know from there are points in the insurance industry and certain um, um, people that um, in moments do this in a very small ecosystem, but actually you should do it full scale. You should do it in your industrial line. You should do it in your shipping line. You should do it in your private line to really provide the customer with digital products and services that he desires. For example, even though apps are not the complete solution, a good example is, for example, the WeChat app. 
Um, it's a platform that provides the customer relief and services in its daily life. And that's why it has become almost 1 billion users in Asia uh, using that. So there are products out there that can do it. There are companies that are doing it. I think the insurance industry needs to get inspired by other industries and go down on that road. Spot On is sponsored by Insurance Licensing Services of America. Need help with corporate name changes, annual returns or surplus lines tax filings? Feeling overwhelmed? If you're looking for experts in regulatory compliance, you've come to the right place. ILSA provides the industry with over 50 services. To learn more about the company and how they can help, visit ilsainc.com. Do you think that the addition of WeSure to WeChat, are they going to start moving in our direction, meaning Europe and the US soon? Well, what I, quite, what I found quite interesting, how they are, um, their, their, their market entry strategy um, seems to me, I, I don't know, I don't have inside information, but I find it quite interesting that they are motivating local stores in cities in which there are a lot of Chinese tourists to adapt WeChat. And WeChat is such a gigantic tool that I can think about that they use then these hubs where then even local people are knowing it then to spread the word. Um, that's at least an, an, a, a strategy I can think about. And because it's a very cheap strategy, they don't need to waste billions in, in marketing and, and entry. On the other hand, we have already here some tools that are quite, that in, in parts that cover parts of it. So. I don't know if they will be successful here, but um, I, I think the principle, the idea of that could be very successful over here. But sooner or later, from what I'm reading in a few places, that China and India will once again take the center stage in, in global politics and business. So if anything, if we're not successful with it, at least copy what they're doing to move forward. I totally agree. I mean, we need to get out of our heads that China is a copycat. We really need, this is a prejudice. Maybe it was true 20 years ago. I don't know. Um, but it's simply not the case anymore. Um, if we go to, to Shanghai or Beijing and we go there, how are young people there acting? What kind of tools and methods are they using? What kind of apps or even the young professionals or even uh, senior people? Um, and then we look at the tools and we compare with what we have. In some areas, they are the leaders in technology. And we need yes. to just acknowledge that and, and congrats uh, and say congrats to them to that. I'm a very deep respect for, for China and the Chinese achievements over the last decades. It's just impressive. And I think instead of, you know, being um, um, sad about it or, or, or being um, um, envious, we should just be inspired by it and ask ourselves, why did they become so successful in the tech perspective? And, and what could we actually learn from that and to be, get to become more successful again? Mm -hmm. Now, in the case of Amazon, Google, Alibaba, when we think about these names and their possible entry or some of them might have already entered the insurance industry. How does this say this is not going away, but this is going to be here? Guys, wake up. Well, the Amazon first um, opened a Lon in London an office, or at least there were the rumors. Then they poached um, um, employees of Lemonade, which made some noise. Then they um, um, publicly announced that they will found a health insurer in the US with Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan, um, I think. And now they even officially entered a German InsurTech initiative. What else do we need more? Do we need Jeff mm -hmm. Bezos running naked through a New York and saying, <laughs> I'm going to go insurance? <laughs> really, but there's still people they're neglecting that. There's still people denying that these tech giants are coming. And what I want to always say, do you know one online bookstore Amazon left alive? Yeah. <laughs> and why do you guys think that they are going to leave us alive? Then they say, oh, they're so nice, they're smiling, we're big, they're big. I'm like, they're smiling because they know we're weak. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for all of us to, you know, make sure that we are on our P's and Q's and are ready to embrace every bit of technology to stay at the forefront. It's important for all of us in this industry. I wanted to just take a moment and just pivot for a minute. I want to get your insight on some of the due diligence that you do on behalf of investors, perhaps when they're exploring a new startup. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do here? Yeah. So um, I'm a product guy and a software guy. So what I don't do is deep dives into financial plannings and the uh, share setup and all of that. So it's not a financial due diligence. I think there are, there are people 10 times better qualified than, than I. But what I'm sometimes asked for is to have a look at the software development process in, so that things don't happen as uh, at the insurer I mentioned. 
So really have to, to look at that, how are they developing software? Is it best practice? Um, how big are they? Are they efficient, or at least from the documents um, that, that one can see? Because I tend to be able to translate between the business world and the really the hardcore tech world. Um, and on the other hand, to really um, uh, have a look at the product development process. So how are they developing new digital or non-digital product? Do they have structures and processes for it? Um, how do they do it? Is it just luck or do they have some secret sauce and that makes them successful? Because when they have good substantial structures and processes and do it in a structured way, then they can reproduce that. If it was just, you know, a lucky shot and everybody loved what they're doing, then it's not reproducible. That means it's not a good investment. And, and I try to give feedback on that. I see. And so is that similar to what you do when you're asked by a startup to do a due diligence for them as well? Yes, but I'm not asked to do a due diligence. It's more like that they ask me to help them with certain question or in general or to find an investor or to, to give feedback on their product strategy and, and software development process. Um, what I do when I ask startups ask me, um, I uh, focus more when I have the status quo, I focus more how can we improve. Investors, most of the time, they just want the evaluation or the, the bullet points and, and not the way how could we improve it. Um, but for, for startups, I really try then to come up with ideas how in their certain very specific situation, they can improve it. So once you tell them how to improve, the next step would be for them to promote themselves. And how do you find are the best uh, ways for a startup to promote themselves? Well, I personally believe the best thing to, um, to promote yourself is honesty. I mean, if you're a 23-year-old um, 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 college grad um, and you have an idea and all charts look like a hockey stick and all charts look like the next big thing and that you don't even have a business model or a product yet, I think the market is past that point. Um, I think honesty is very, very honest, uh, important to yourself but also to, to the other people involved so they can see, okay, this person has a, a correct way to um, estimate the situation and themselves. I, I cannot tell you how many people wanted me to sign NDAs before a first call. And I'm like, guys, uh, I can give you several multi-trillion dollar uh, ideas, and, mm -hmm. and not because it's smart, but because they are out there. It's about the execution. You know, find a self-optimizing algorithm that um, 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 changes insurance contracts for the best of the customer and that's legally possible. That's a multi-trillion dollar uh, idea. Go, do it. Um, but the, the doing is the hard stuff. So I would say, guys, you need to be honest to yourself and, and a little bit modest, but then also tell your story. I think storytelling, sharing, taking people on the journey is crucial. I, um, uh, For example, I went to a conference and I had there a very small startup who has a great idea, but also shares their journey with podcasts and content. They don't go there and say, we're the best InsurTech or um, uh, company out there, but they just share their story. And with that, they um, uh, get a lot of uh, traction and, 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 and following ship and that they can use also for the business opportunities. Um, yes. Do you think the broker is going to survive this? Where will the broker go in all this? Well, I'm, I'm proud to say that during my time at Allianz, I actually was an uh, Allianz agent and selling insurances on the couches uh, here in Hamburg um, before then uh, was sent to the headquarters in Munich. So I really know, at least for Europe, how insurances are sold right now. Um, in agents and insurers. So to not answer your question is, I would, I would put it in different parts. I believe the famous brokers and agents that are killing it, they would kill it everywhere. They would kill it in the Middle Ages, they would kill it right now, they would kill it on Mars because they're just good at what they're doing. Um, and even if we would have all the paradig paradigm shifts I talked earlier about what I think is necessary, they would crush it. But the number of them is very, very, very limited. And I don't want to you know, reveal company secrets, but you have the 80-20 principle uh, in general, that 20% uh, of your effort generates 80% of the outcome. I strongly believe this is the case for most insurances that have brokers and agents connected to them. I think you have a tremendous amount of agents and brokers still that's not productive and that's um, uh, not very um, not, not productive or they're even just, you know, making it a little bit. And for those, I think there will be hard times sooner or later. 
But my question I would ask the um, very good broker that's crushing it or the agent that's crushing it, and I would ask them, does your carrier you will prefer to work with or the, the carriers you work with, do they provide you right now with the value, skills, you will need in the 21st century to be successful. And maybe you have now preferred carriers that have you know, great commission, great services, but maybe there's a smaller one that gives you the digital tools and services you actually want to have um, for the future. And I think, on the other hand, carriers or other insurance companies need to ask themselves, what can we do for the brilliant brokers and the brilliant agents those who do almost all the business. Got it. Okay, that's wonderful. Robin, I know that you attend many insurance conferences around the country, well, around the world. Tell us, in your opinion, what are some of the must-attend conferences in our space if for the insure tax for traditional brokers, or maybe, I don't know if you perhaps go more to the insure tech ones, but what are some of the really value bomb ones that are out there? I think this depends largely on, on your goal. So um, if you are an innovator in a, in a corporate, you have a different um, goal than an insure tech that's looking for funding, um, or um, if you are an agent and broker that really wants to go out there. I would answer your question the following way. I would say, again, we live in times in which the knowledge of the world is out there. To start, to do the first step, to do the to do the step from zero to one. You don't need to go to a conference. If you are in the most remote place on the planet and you are working in insurance and you feel that the wind is getting a little bit colder, you can go, you know, Google, YouTube, LinkedIn, the knowledge of what's going on is out there. Do that first. And from that, you find your conferences around in your country, in your region. Maybe even, in, I would even advise to not only go to insure tech and insurance conferences, but also to non-insurance uh, topics. Go to technology conferences. Go to a hackathon that has nothing to do with your industry. Go to e-commerce or something and get inspired there. Then because maybe they have recipes you can use then in your own area. So I would answer the question like this, but there are a lot of great shows. Maybe InsureTech Connect, maybe InsureTech Insights. There are some, some smaller shows around the world. Um, you have some great interesting um, events in Dubai, um, uh, in the U.S., the uh, global insurance supposing for example where i just was it was a really cool cool event there are, i think a ton of great events but i think don't get intimidated by it just start by surfing and by really uh, getting yourself out there in your community locally great point the thing is right now for knowledge the ability to be able to consume these conferences after they've taken place by getting a recording of the conferences is so valuable. And then, you know, you're able to consume all of this information and then perhaps, you know, just for networking purposes is attend a few conferences throughout the year just to get to know people face to face. Robin, one thing that I would love to hear about is what you're working on right now. Tell us a little bit about what digital scouting is doing and what's in the future for you guys. So digital scouting um, uh, is a platform for thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and uh, innovators uh, in, inside uh, companies focusing on insurance and, and the banking world. It started actually just as a small side and then just literally exploded. And uh, I needed actually to decide uh, some time ago, um, do I want to do this as a hobby uh, or do I want to do it professionally? So right now, I actually have a team around the world that supports me and digital scouting is not just me anymore, but just a team, a team around the world. So what I try to provide is really give the innovators and the, the rebels and the thought leaders uh, a space where they can share their insights, also document a lot um, and, and, and provide value and content uh, to, to people. So when, I, when I'm at a conference, I do a little video um, um, of me and others and so that everybody can, can sneak preview without traveling for, for days. What will be the next thing really uh, depends on where things are going. I have a few things in the pipeline, but I'm not uh, yet ready yet to share, but I will do it uh, uh, sooner or later. We'll keep going on to your platform and Thanks. looking for all the new innovative things that I know that you're going to keep uh, developing. So look forward to it. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe one fun fact, how insane um, digital scouting actually has developed. Um, I, uh, on a train ride, I wrote an article Actually, I translated an article I published in English into German and I submitted it to an insurance magazine and boom, it became the most read article in insurance industry of that year. Wow. It was really insane. And 
this is things like that happen all the time. And maybe one, one, one more thing, what is, this, what is special about digital scouting is we're not afraid to call out the elephant in the room. I mean, a lot of people are not talking about what is going to happen to insurance employees when they're not being educated for the future or what is going to happen with the agent. I know people see suits that stand in front of their sales force and say, we are going to protect the agent and they all are already preparing major, um, not layoffs, but at least major changes there. So, and, and, I, and I say, let's talk about this now. Maybe you don't need to, you know, uh, let go 80%, but maybe only 50%. We can save 30% when we educate them and make them actually to power sellers in the digital age. Yeah, that's why we're bringing these questions to the airwaves because we're asking that question and we're asking the agents and brokers to ask themselves that question also and to decide if they're in that top 20% that's going to evolve and give them an avenue for evolution. Yeah, and this is why it's so valuable and I'm so happy to turn on your show to really, we need all to get the word out there um, because things are moving slowly as in our industry, but they're moving and I think that's a great, great thing. I appreciate you coming out and just saying that, come on guys, wake up, either surround yourself with the brains that you need or, you know, so much is dependent on it. I really love that message that you communicate. So I appreciate that. One thing I want to ask is what do you see in terms of the pipeline, especially with blockchain? How do you see it evolving in our industry? I mean, I know that there's a lot of reinsurers and carriers that are working on some initiatives to incorporate blockchain technology, but I want to get your opinion on where you see all of this going. Well, blockchain is a little bit like a wild card um, because um, a lot of people are talking about it, but um, I'm personally, I am not totally sure. I've seen a few good um, use cases, um, flight delay insurance, for example, but I have not wrapped my head around it completely. Um, I just want to be very honest and transparent there. But what I believe is very important for the people that are working in the blockchain space and that were, are working on, on use cases you guys, I think personally, you need to go out there and you need to educate the rest. If we all don't understand what actually going on or what the technology actually can do, but you do, it's not our fault, but it's more like <laughs> to educate us. You need to educate investors. You need to educate people that uh, want to help you with your endeavor. So I think it's urgently that the people in the blockchain sphere really make an effort to, to explain what they're doing and to really support the rest that to take them with on the journey. Because but you guys said it already earlier. It's not just blockchain what's out there. AI is a gigantic topic. I mean, you have simple logics that already can be calculated, uh, defined as AI. You have self-optimizing algorithms. You have like insane things that were unthinkable only a few years ago. Um, you have uh, VR, AR, and that are revolutionizing everything. I don't think we are going to use a keyboard uh, in 10 years or five years. You have voice. I think voice is gigantic what's going on there. So, and there are so many topics that are, you know, uh, slamming uh, uh, on us. Important topic like blockchain really need to make their voice heard, but in a way we actually understand it. That's one of the points that I was making earlier when I read that piece from your website, professionals in the industry are getting hit from so many sides that it's really just freezing people in their place. But on blockchain, I was just looking at an IBM commercial yesterday. Or well, maybe they want to deviate from Watson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Watson, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Little joke. I mean, don't forget me wrong. I the best, um, some of the best colleagues and projects I ever worked were with with most talent and tech knowledge to work people from IBM. So I really, really respect the company. But I think on, on Watson, they oversold a little bit. <laughs> yes, yes. Watson's not doing as great as Alexa. Yeah. I want to just in closing, if you would be able to share one piece of advice for someone that's just entering the insurance industry or considering entering, what would that be? Ooh. Let me put it this way. I think it's important to see your time in the insurance industry as a project and get side projects. Don't get into the silo of insurance. Don't you know, be satisfied with the status quo or be you know, blinded by the, by the marble house and the large buildings and the attitude and the culture and the titles and the corner offices and the company cars you know this is uh, things that are vanity there they, they might vanish but um, if you want to be successful in that you know learn a lot about the insurance industry because it's complicated you have um, uh, all the statistics and claim and processes it's not easy you know to set up an insurance as for example a, an online store for something else but also put your outs uh, with other topics in with other topics may it be technology may it be not technology actually doesn't matter. Um, but, you know, 
don't isolate yourself. That's my, my most urgent uh, thing there. I think that's great advice. If there are folks out here uh, in our circle of professionals that are listening, how do they get in touch with you? So what I would love uh, to is I just started a you know, new YouTube channel uh, on digital scouting. So if you subscribe to that, I really would fall in love with you. Um, <laughs> uh, because uh, not so many people as my other channels, I really would love that. Uh, and then just, you know, uh, write me on LinkedIn follow me on Twitter, you know, write me. I'm happy to chat. Um, or when I'm in a conference, uh, come and let's talk. Let's have a coffee. Uh, I'm really eager to hear what's going on in, in your company and industry and your life. Okay, fantastic. Robin, it's been our pleasure to have you on Spot on Insurance. Thank you so much for all of the information that you've shared with our listeners. Can't wait to continue to follow you on YouTube and on your platform. And I wish you the very best of luck. Same to you. Thank you for supporting the community. Join us next week and get to know Karn Soroya, co-founder and CEO of Cover. We discuss Xbox, body scanning, and the formation of Stylekick. We also touch upon how Cover was formed, keys to the business, and expediting claims. Then we discuss regulatory compliance, specifically Zenefits, and learning from the fiasco. Karn also talks about how Cover drastically simplifies onboarding for traditional lines of insurance by embracing technology to streamline the process and enhance the customer experience. You also learn why it makes sense to insure tech startups to put the customer at the core. That's episode 62 of Spot on Insurance. Visit spotoninsurance.com where you'll discover an ever-growing library of podcasts, videos, articles, and online tools by professionals for professionals to enhance your insurance education. By the way, that's where you'll also find our podcast notes and bonus resources. Please don't forget to click the iTunes link to rate and review and let others know what you think of Spot On Insurance. Thank you for joining us, and we'll catch you next week.